I guess we'll, whoa, hello. I guess we'll call in the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for December 12th, uh, call to order. Let's do a roll call. Taylor Wicklin. Here. Patrick Hinterberger. Present. David McInerney. Here. Steve Lehner. Here. Diane Christ. Here. Council Member Yarbrough. Okay, uh, we'll move on to approving the minutes of the preceding meeting from uh, November. I uh, need a motion to approve. I'll move to approve the minutes from our November meeting. Do I have a second? I second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and I guess we've added an item. We'll go ahead and um, have a discussion and a uh, nomination process for the vice chairperson role on the Transportation Advisory Board. Do I have any nominations? I nominate Diane Christ to become our vice chair. Any other nominations? Okay. Um, I guess we'll just do a quick vote then. Um, all those in favor of Diane Christ being vice chairperson of the Transportation Advisory Board, say aye. 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 <laughs> okay, and we'll move on to communications from staff. Great, thank you, Chair Lehner. Uh, my name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planner with the Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. Just wanted to quickly introduce, we talked a little bit about this last month that we had hired uh, a new Transportation Administrative Administrator. Administrator. <laughs> And that is Kyle Hayworth, and uh, here he is. Kyle, uh, maybe you could just give us a little brief background and introduction. Thanks. i learn that first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Kyle Hayworth. I'm the uh, Transportation Engineering Manager. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm looking very forward to working with you guys for, to help improve safety of the city. Um, I came from the city of North Glen, um, just kind of surrounded by Thornton, so I've dealt with a lot of more... Um, city traffic and uh, commerce, um, and but I am local. I did grow up in Loveland, um, so grew up there, came up here, and I'm slowly moving back more north, it feels like. So, um, like I said, it's great to work with you guys and look forward to make community, community a lot safer. Okay, welcome. Great, we're excited to have Kyle on board, obviously, so this will be, this is Good news for the city of Longmont, so appreciate him coming tonight. We'll probably let him go if he needs to, but uh, he might stick around for a little while here to see how things go. Just wanted to also talk a little bit about the mayor's transit meetup that happened on December 3rd. So we, uh, Jim was reminding me that we entered through some doors that had been, um, um, I guess the First Amendment was uh, used to put some signs up that uh, said what they felt about cars, and some of them were a little bit more uh, un well, non-discreet than other messages, but it was pretty much uh, cars kill was the message. And so we did see that as we walked in the door, but uh, uh, once we got inside, there was a pretty good crowd, and I know uh, uh, Board Member Wickland was there as well, and I think Board Member Chris, I saw you in the audience. Not, I didn't get to talk to you too much, but I uh, apologize for that. But um, we did have a pretty good turnout. I think we had maybe 25, 30 people. Um, but uh, we had the Front Range Passenger Rail folks kind of introduce the kind of the statewide ideas of transit and uh, mostly rail. It was the, the rail was the focus. And that transitioned into an RTD discussion, a regional transportation dis district discussion about buses and rail and their, you know, their timelines and their, their goals and how they see uh, their role in that and working with Front Range Passenger Rail, quite frankly. And then I kind of threw in some things about our local transit and just 
things we're thinking about, maybe getting away from RTD a little bit and some of these things, let RTD focus on the regional piece and then we were really talking about how we could focus on the local piece and maybe go out to a third party private sector vendor for some of that. So we're looking at some options that have been used around the country. And so uh, that was kind of it. it uh, I think it went pretty well. Um, like I said, none of that maybe anger that was from the front of the building really translated into the actual meeting, so that was nice. Um, it was a pretty, uh, pretty polite uh, crowd, and that's great. It shows well for Longmont, I think, with all the different folks that showed up. Um, but any, any questions or any comments from the folks who were there? Um, I'd love to hear your take on how you felt things went. Phil, I thought you did a great job, and I was very impressed with how the turnout for that event. Um, if I were going to point out any weakness, I think it's in the state program for transportation. You know, I think um, I think we need a better plan for moving people throughout the state. You know, on the high, decongesting the highways. But I think our our local plan is solid, and. Um, and also, kind of the regional in terms of you know getting from Fort Collins to Boulder to Longmont was was um, yeah, helpful. And I think um, we've identified that we need a little better, bit better bus service in Longmont, a little better accessibility. So and maybe Taylor has some other ideas. Well, uh, hold. On. Original thoughts of the meeting because I was more excited about the rail discussion because I was 14 when fast tracks was passed and it still is not a thing. So um, I'm hopeful. I just wonder what what's going to be the overall timeline. And I did email Andy and you know can't give a timeline anyways. So um, uh, but you know I, I think Phil you did a great job. I think Longmont's very progressive and trying to think forward uh, beyond the car, really. Um, I'm just hoping the regional part will sustain itself somehow to also improve, yeah. Phil, could you give us a brief summary of some of the non-RTD transit ideas you presented? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Chair, or Chair Lehner and, and Board Member McInerney, I can't go into too many details, but uh, I do know there's a couple of groups out there. We, we actually have via mobility services in Boulder County that's been very active as far as paratransit. And uh, I gave some bad information, evidently, to, to some of the folks and said that via was uh, open to everyone, anybody could take it. And that's true if you're in a rural area, but not in an urban area. So in the urban areas in Longmont, it really is for older adults and people with uh, dis disabilities. So uh, we, we point people toward the flex ride service, but VIA is kind of underlying all those different services. So VIA has their own service. They run, they contract out with RTD for um, other mobility micro-mobility services or micro-transit services, I should say, smaller transit. And uh, they, they would be one of the people that may apply. If we put out a request for proposal, which we have to do by city code, we'd have to put out a request for proposal and be pretty specific about how much we can spend on this and what we're looking for from a provider. So it would have to be very specific. And uh, they said that they'd be interested. And then there's a via transportation services that's more national. It's actually international, but it's, it's done a lot of things in uh, Arlington, Texas uh, is one of the places where they operate. Uh, there's a couple places in North Carolina and they're smaller. Most of them are more smaller cities, kind of like Longmont and they have provided some information to us about what they can, what they can provide and, and those timelines. We've really talked about um, waiting no more than 15 minutes to take a trip that lasts no more than 15 minutes across town. And so that's our goal is, and it's really built for people who don't have access to a private vehicle. So we're talking, those are the kind of the three goals that we wanna put into um, a request for proposals or a scope of work. And that would go out nationally. We'd let everybody know about it. Uh, we, we would get many more than just those two that I've mentioned. So uh, 
but that's that has to go through this board. We have to come back here. We'd have to talk to you about it. You'd have to make a recommendation to council. So we'd have to go to council on that, and we'd have to really start to get our ducks in a row for all the different things that that means because that's that's a fairly significant chunk of dollars. So we'd need to go for some grants probably to get to get the um, you know the seed money to at least buy the equipment, and then we'd have to talk about the sustainability of that because we don't want this to be like the bike share program where we kind of went in and there was a, a sponsorship piece of that and eventually they went away and it, it kind of flopped, quite frankly. So we don't want that to happen here. And that's, oh, that's part of this. We just need a very sustainable approach and something that we can uh, count on for years and not just a um, year or a couple, a couple months. You know, We need something that'll uh, be there in the long term. Okay. One last question. Um, was there any discussion about, and this is aligning kind of with the comment you're talking about with the program with VIA, about the last mile? It seems to be that's the biggest challenge that we have with any sort of end-to-end, -end, whether it's rapid transit to a com you know, uh, transportation plan, uh, when we're talking about commuting, are we really addressing that last mile piece? And was there any discussion of that, I guess I would ask? Chair Lena, there were a couple questions about that and we really did try to talk about trying to mix in all the things that we you know a, a better more, more robust bicycle system a better more robust and I think I said safe reliable and comfortable bicycle pedestrian system and transit system so all these di different things and we talk about regional transit but then how does that translate into that more local gridded you know uh, nearby transit and that idea of not waiting more than 30 minutes total for once you request a ride to get somewhere. Um, so we talked about a mix and a blend of all those different things to find cover that final mile or first mile. Thank you. Chair, we had no more items from staff. So that was it. We have lots of things going on. Oh, we all, that's not true. We had one other thing I wanted to see if Jim would talk about. Uh, the Boston Avenue Bridge. So real quick informational item. Um, we've been working on the uh, Boston Avenue Bridge, which is one of the phases um, of the RSVP um, improvement project. Uh, that project, we finally got that uh, design done, permitted. It is now out to bid. The bids are due in the, uh, I believe, the third week in January. Um, so we anticipate seeing construction uh, underway um, more than likely in March, April timeframe. It's right near Left Hand Brewery, <laughs> um, which will help. Uh, we've we the, the trail's been closed in that area for for quite some time. This will be the next phase. Um, the next phase beyond that is the Army Corps of Engineers project. Uh, they are at about ninety five percent design. Uh, anticipate that um, they will start construction in spring summer of this year, uh, but they have a uh, they have a, like a year time frame on their project. The Boston Avenue Bridge is an eighteen month project. Uh, we do anticipate um, it will be built uh, in stages, anticipating that we will uh, maintain the flow of traffic on Boston. Very good. Do we have any public invited here? To be heard? Just staff. Okay. Um, I guess then we can move on to the information items, starting with the um, crash report, which I know that's been long awaited. Sure, I'm sorry. Um, I, <laughs> I, I will uh, introduce Caroline Michael, who worked on that uh, report almost exclusively. So this is really her her baby. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Caroline to talk more about kind of the overall trends that we've noticed in the crash data for this latest year. Hello, board. Um, does everyone have a copy of it with them? Because uh, there's some hard copies over there. Anyone doesn't have one? Huh. OK. 
Okay. So I don't know how many of you like dug into this like way beforehand and already have questions like raring to go. But um, I was just gonna maybe like do a brief overview of like overall trends. Um, so from section one, uh, figure one, which just has a list of every crash record we've recorded in the city back to 2000. Um, we also have it back to actually like 1990, but I split it off at 2000 for some readability. Um, you can see there's 1,661 records in our system, and that is the city system, not necessarily counting any additional CDOT records, which we'll get to. But um, so it's still um, higher than 2020, which is to be expected. 2020 was a very low year in terms of crashes for pretty um, like explanatory, like self-explanatory reasons. Um, tra traffic went down quite a bit um, during COVID-19. We're still kind of below kind of the highs we were seeing from like 2015 to 2019. Um, I think we were still, I think PD was still an accident alert for at least part of 21 at the beginning. So there's, which you, basically means that some of the more minor ones don't always get reported. Um, all the serious ones should still be included though. But um, in, in general, we're kind of moving past any COVID-19 and anything I think we're seeing now might be more permanent in terms of just some shifts in like work from home becoming more popular and more people like utilizing that option and maybe not seeing the same peaks at some intersections, especially during like the rush hour traffic times. But um, yeah, we've also had, um, but you can see from the blue line, the injury or worse is kind of still in line with what we were seeing pre-COVID. And um, we had seven fatalities in 2021, and that's counting crash numbers, not necessarily individuals, because one, fatal crash can sometimes result in more than one fatality. Um, figure 1.1, I think, has a better view of Longmont's population and how crashes have kind of changed in regard to population. So even as our population has gone up, um, we are still having like pretty high numbers or a pretty high crash rate back in like 2000, 2001 despite having a lower population in the city. But um, yeah, and the, so the 16.6 .6 crashes per 1,000 population is still a decrease from 2020 again. Um, but again, we are not quite back at that um, pre-2020 level at this time. Um, I'm not sure how many we have at, for total for 2022 at this time, but we'll see like kind of maybe next year how that ends up playing out. Um, for section two is a lot of kind of data about timing and when our crash has happened. Um, a lot of this is pretty similar to what it's been in the past. So I don't think anything here was very surprising to me. Um, you know, we get most of our 7 a.m to 8 p.m. most of when these happen, um, usually not too many during the early morning, late night hours. Um, and you can kind of see from that figure 2.1, these trends have been pretty consistent for the past five years. Um, and then moving on, uh, most crashes on Friday, again, that's kind of how it's been for a while. I don't have a very I don't, reasoned explanation for why that is, but um, pretty consistent, less on Sundays, kind of to be expected. Um, one thing is that it used to be that December was the highest like month for crash reports, but it's actually kind of shifted to October. And again, I actually don't have much of an explanation as to why, we, maybe we do have, there's more that happen in like the back last six months of the year than like the first six months of the year. Again, I don't 100% know why that happens because it's even higher in 
August, September than it is in February or March. So, again, but it's pretty consistent with what's happened before. So, not too surprising in the data findings. Um, section three um, goes over some of the common um, causes of like impairment, which is the DUI which is increasingly changing to include um, the new crash report that the state has actually actually calls out uh, marijuana usage specifically, which before they didn't, and they actually made the change to that form in May 2021. So it'll be maybe interesting to see how much of that actually gets recorded. But um, they've definitely been on, uh, the DUIs have been like pretty flat like overall over the 2000 to 21 but um they're still like a lot higher than probably what than what we'd like to see like we saw some very high numbers in like 2018 19. yeah just a quick question <clears throat> if i could mm -hmm. um with the medical complications in this section um with impairment mm -hmm. how do they verify whether it's a medical complication versus let's face it somebody could be looking at their phone and say, oh, I had something happen where I passed out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so is, is that a concern that that could change or not give us an accurate picture when it comes to these numbers? Um, that's a good question. And that's one I can't answer very well because it, they do have separate, so the crash reports that they get, they're separate contributing factors. And so like medical complication is one of them but there's also ones that discover distracted driving from cell phone usage, you know, other vehicle occupants, radio, and it goes on. But um, as far as how many people might not be honest about that, I don't know. It's possible. But those have also been kind of on an upward trend, um, which on one hand, um, there is some like maybe demographic change, like older populations, people driving as they get into like more as they're like getting into the seven their seventies and eighties um, could contribute partially to that. And um, unfortunately, they usually don't say on the report what it really is, like what it just says medical complication, and that's kind of it. So. And um, kind of as a side note to this, that's not really on here, but um, AAA actually has a research division where they do like nationwide surveys. And they just actually put out their most recent, it's like the crash, uh, the driving safety culture index um, where they have like a random sample of like 2,600 drivers nationwide, it's not state specific, where they pull people about how dangerous to, do you perceive this behavior to be behind the wheel versus, okay, but how many times did you actually do it in the past 30 days? And the in, results are very interesting if you wanna look it up. Um, so, and there were quite a few, as I remember like driving while like excessively drowsy, like quite a few people like admit to doing that. So, um, it's AAA. If you Google like AAA research, yeah, you can yeah you can find it online pretty easily. And I haven't like they just put it out like in it was like December twenty two, so I haven't read through the whole thing. But yeah, a lot of people do admit to using their phones, especially the um, you know hands free, which isn't perceived to be as dangerous as holding the phone to your ear, but is still, I think, pretty distracting when you're driving. So it's interesting to see how the public perception of that is. Um, so again, um, other contributing factors to like make up the bulk of crashes we see, so. And one last question, mm -hmm. sorry. No, go ahead. Like, ask questions, please. 
when I looked at the fatality reports mm -hmm. on each one of those, I was struck by how many distracted driving was the cause or contributing factor, but we don't have any charts on distracted driving here. We just have impairment, medical, drowsy, those sorts of things, mm -hmm. but nothing about distracted driving. So I'm just curious if, are those numbers that are gonna start getting tracked or? We, we can. Like that's something if like you're interested in seeing it, I can like put it in to a table. Part of it is um Is there a trend line to it? That's the thing. Yeah. I mean, are we seeing uh -huh. a trend of higher distracted driving? And and I'm speaking from personal experience as a driver, as an mm -hmm. auto driver. I, I see a lot of it now. And and I just don't know if that is a trend or if it's just I just coincidence, I'm just saying this. Yeah. And um it's also one of those things, especially with cell phones, that I suspect is probably underreported. Because there's not, because the police usually don't get there until after the crash has already happened. And if it's not serious, they might not do, I can't really speak for them, but it might not be the most. Oh, wait, we do. But, um, yeah, it might be underreported. Wait, do we have five? Figure 6.3 has a graph for like distracted driving yeah. crashes. I knew I had seen it. <laughs> but that, um, yeah, that has some. It's not like delineated by the specific like subcategories of it, but it might, it gives some insight on that issue. Um, just going through it, because um, I don't need to explain like every graph on here. But um, a lot of the demographics you can see pretty young men are, are often the drivers suspected of driving under the influence. Um, it's a, more equal for some of the medical sleep fatigue crashes. But it's still like young men, a lot of them. So um, I'm sure very various societal causes of that, but probably won't speculate too heavily. Um, so vulnerable road users, um, we've done this in the past slightly differently. Um, in the past, we also included, I, I, you know, I, I'm always kind of on the fence whether or not to include motorcycles. I didn't this time. Um, I think they're sufficiently different from like a bicycle or a pedestrian that they're more of a motor vehicle, but again, it's always something we could continue to point out on the report specifically. Uh, Carolyn, I, I'm just in, I think you've been referring to this as just um, some relational data, which I don't mm -hmm. know how you would collect it, but it would be helpful to, if we were going to affect any of these numbers, know um, some kind of cause and effect or some kind of patterns that we're seeing. But I did notice, um, and I guess I'm looking at figure 1.1, .1, that for the most part, the, the trend in crash rates follows the population growth, except for the years 2008 to, through 2014, where it's below the growth line. And the only thing I can add to that is, I know that's during the Great Recession. And yeah. I wonder if that had some impact on, on crash rates. I, I'm not sure how, what your, in, what your input would be on why that would affect that, the crash rate. But. I mean, that's probably the biggest factor I would think of, uh. would be recession. So, like under unemployment, probably resulted in less commuting. Now that's not to say um, COVID was kind of interesting. I mean, we definitely saw less then too. So I think there's some correlation. Um, but the bounce that, back rate in 2021 seemed like it was high because some people were still working from home, I think. I think it was, I forget what the numbers are, maybe 60% went back to commuting. But so I wonder if that's a, out of practice type <laughs> situation. Vice Chair Chris, if I may, there was also issues almost, I mean, this was a national trend was 
as people started returning to work and there had been this huge lull in traffic and, and crashes, as people returned to work, the roads were wide open. And so people were able to go faster. And so we, nationally the trend was that we saw more severe crashes from opening businesses in late 21 into 20, or late 20 into 21. So that might be part of the issue. Again, we're speculating. But this definitely shows that people were not crashing as much and not driving as much in during the recession years just because of the fact, yeah, no job, I don't have a job. Uh, typically the gas prices go up, so it's more expensive to drive and all those different factors. So people cut down their driving for a number of different reasons. So that's why we see some of these trend lines the way we do and, and why you see such a sharp increase, though it's it's one of the lower numbers on this table, so still, except for 2020. but. That might be some of the factors. I wanted to point it out because it was one of the few um, where I had some relational data I could kind of add into it or, or surmise, I guess. So, thank you. Okay. Well, some things I included, one table I included that's new on this was table 4.1, where I was trying to determine, because this is a question that comes up pretty frequently, and even this isn't as detailed as it could be, although I could, I tried to like condense it into something of like a readable form for this report. But, um, you know, where are pe pedestrian and cyclist crashes happening? Like, where are people most vulnerable on our roadways? Which parts of our roadways needs Im need improvement? Um, so Main Street um, came out pretty high on this list. That is, on one hand, counting like all of Maine. I mean, that's like Plateau to Park Ridge Avenue. But um, if you want to break it down in some like more granularity, I that is possible. Um, I wrote down some of it. Um, I think Maine in Mountain View was the highest single intersection with like nine in the five year period. Um, also downtown, um, as I was defining from second to ninth, although I think it might actually be to first. I'm not sure. I was, I was doing second to ninth though. But, um, and that was accounted for 25. So if you think of like that segment, and that was the intersections and the mid blocks. Not necessarily the mid block crosswalks in downtown Maine. Some of them were, I know at least two were actually in the 200 block. But, um, and that in, did include 9th and Maine, which has like six on its own. But yeah, and um, it's also, most of these are the higher volume arterials. Um, we do, Mountain View Avenue is a collector. It is a bit of a higher volume collector than some others. It is like a straight, you can go airport to Deerwood or all the way through. So it does get, I think, maybe some volume or more volume than some other collectors. But um, yeah, I, I don't, unless there's any comments from the board. Um, Move on. Um, okay, comparison with other cities. This one. So I'm the data from this was referenced from CDOT has like publicly available like fact sheets that are uh, fatal crash statistics by city. So um, pulling from those, um, kind of using like a five year average. Um, our rate per population is higher than some of our neighbor cities, um, including higher than Fort Collins, Boulder, um, and Loveland. Um, we are still behind. We still have rates lower than places like Commerce City, Pueblo, Lakewood, and Grand Junction. Um, I tried to pick communities with at least some kind of a comparable population, but it's... Um, get a pretty widespread in Colorado. Um, 
Yeah, and um, from this table you can, I, at least I've been trying to like kind of work backwards. Okay, well, why does, do certain communities have like much lower rates than we do? And why is that? Um, it's like Centennial is the lowest one on this list. I'm still, you know, looking at it from the high level, I'm not 100% sure why. Lower um, speeds. Lower speeds. But they do have some like wide, you know, like four or five lane arterial intersections that are not too different from ours, it would seem. So I wonder why. I don't know. It's very, I've only done like a very like surface kind of reasoning of this. So I guess stay tuned, but <laughs> on what strategies that um, maybe other communities do that we can potentially implement. I would think looking at the list, Loveland, Arvada, maybe Broomfield would have more similar characteristics than a Centennial, because I would think Centennial being or I won't call it urban, of course, but suburban and so locked that it's going to have, on average, I would think, lower speeds in general just because of the uh, um, the amount of traffic that they have, I would think. <laughs> That's one thing we've speculated on is that there's a congestion level here, especially in the city of Boulder. Whenever we compare to them, they seem so much lower that there's a, you know, a very much when they're high demand on their roadways, they're, it's very congested and so the cars move very slowly. So the severity of the crashes or the number of crashes is, is lower too. So in some ways congestion is good, we think, but we need to, we need to look into that more and make sure we have that dialed in a little better, better for you all. On that issue, um, the comparison between Longmont and Boulder, is the default speed limit in Boulder lower than it is in Longmont? They did change it to 20 on local streets relatively recently. Boulder has changed it. They have a Vision Zero policy, and so their action plan is enacted and going. And so they did do some speed limit changes on a, on a, on a number of, a large number of streets, but the enforcement issue is still the critical factor there. So in my, there's one street, there's a couple streets that I have to use all the time to when I travel to Boulder and it's, there's, the speeds haven't changed. The speed limit has changed, but the speeds have not changed. So we need to look into that as we move to a vision zero policy is how, how productive is that? How cost effective is changing a, a sign versus really getting the speeds down? We really do think it's more of that congestion piece that's helping. Uh, oh yes. Um, one question, do you know how this compares with the national average? Not the national, but I do. There's two other tables on here with, yeah, like other states and nationwide communities that again were chosen. Well, one based on proximity, and then also just like population. Although really, well, really probably what I should have done is population density. In some of these, is probably the more accurate measure, because some of these you get like pretty rural. We have like a lot of rural highway sections on some, especially in the nationwide categories. So it might not be a very like great one one to from that to Longmont, even if it's sure like the same population. But um, um I mean, you can see. I mean, like nationwide, there's definitely some areas of the country that probably have like much higher incidence of fatal crashes, and then there's some that have much lower. So. It would be interesting to look into more. I do know that fatals are generally on an upward trend, though, like nationwide. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, um, is there any mechanism you guys would reach out to Centennial or Boulder or Arvada and just ask them what they're doing, if they have any novel ideas? Yeah, I mean, I... I, I Oh, yeah, with Dr. Cog. There is a Dr. Cog, like, Vision Zero group that yeah. where people will sometimes, like, share and collaborate ideas. But, um, yeah, but, yeah, but it, yeah, I mean, it's, like, definitely something, like, how are you keeping your rates, like, relatively low compared? And it's, again, like, I have some theories, but it's nothing I've 
that's proven by any means, so. Okay. Like for one, one thing is I know some of these, like Centennial's a pretty new community. It was like incorporated, I wanna say early 2000s. And it's like, we've been around since the 1800s. <laughs> so we probably have some more like grid infrastructure, especially in like the downtown area. And a lot more just like four way intersections that create more opportunities for like conflict. But then at the same time, that's not necessarily where we see the fatal crashes happen either, so. If I could just say, I mean, based on relation of population to fatalities, mm -hmm. Centennial, Arvada, Loveland must be doing something better in regards to that when our number, population-wise is close, but our number is so much higher. And if I look at the trend all the way across from 2017 to 2021, you know, 2019 is an outlier, but even still, compared to those communities, I, I think board member Hinderberger has a great idea of can we interface with traffic staff there and find out are they doing something? Yeah. You know, is it, what, you know, is it education? Is it, you know, whatever it might be. Well, also, as we move into the Vision Zero realm, that'll just be part of that discussion. That'll be something we have to do in, in order to kind of figure out, yeah, how to, how to make these changes to get to our vision of zero. I'll move on to section six. Um, so and ice, it's something we've been tracking for a while. Um, it has gone, it was significantly lower in 21, which isn't, as I remember, it was a pretty mild winter. We didn't, didn't even really get snow until like very late in the year. So that doesn't surprise me too much. But um, again, that's something that well, we can't control the weather, but we can't control like roadway treatments after and plowing and what our response time is to that. So that is a way we can um, help maybe bring those numbers down if they need to in the future. Um, again, these to total crashes involving the younger and older demographic, something we've been tracking for a while. It's been a pretty dramatic change if you look at it from the past. It used to be a very high, um, the 18 or younger, like teenage demographic used to be involved in a lot more um, crashes than they are now. And it's evened out, you know, um, or now it's actually below um, sort of that 65 plus demo. So it's just like that demographic change that's been happening. And we think that's probably related to the different, um, ideas of how you get your li your license these days. I think anybody who has anybody in that 16 year old or been through that recently, the 16 year old driver's license, it's much more difficult to get now and you can't drive with, you know, your friends from 16 to 17 now. And there's a bunch of rules until you turn 18, which weren't in place uh, in the early 2000s. So we think that that's part of this trend. Yeah, and then figure 6.2 is kind of, is similar, except it's supposed to be the at-fault driver, which traditionally was always um, like vehicle one in an accident, although there's some gray area to that sometimes, but you can see they've leveled out like quite a bit in terms of demographics. So when it used to be a much higher of like the young, like 18 and younger crowd. Um, and then figure 6.3 is distracted driving. So it, it is that uh, blue line at the bottom, so 207, which is lower than those like uh, 350, 346, uh, 337 numbers. Again, um, I suspect there's challenges with reporting some of those things. So it's not the easiest thing to maybe get a handle on, but um, especially for the sort of more minor rear ends that might happen. Um. Uh, 
Um, Caroline, I have a question. I notice on the bottom um, there on 6.3 in 2006, there was a, a dip in distracted driving. And I noticed um, that same dip in figure 3.0, um, DUI and medical asleep fatigue crashes. I wonder, was there more um, censoring of that by the police departments, do you think? I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's something that could be verified. Yeah, in 2006. It shows up in both graphs. Yeah, yeah, I probably couldn't tell you back then because I did not live in Colorado <laughs> and certainly didn't work for the city at that time. So I'm not 100% sure, but I'm not sure if Phil has any insight. How long have you worked for the city? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, longer than that, um, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Um, well, fortunately, but unfortunately, I'm getting old. But um, yeah, I can't think of what happened in 2006 that was necessarily lead to that kind of dip. I'm trying to think of, mm -hmm. again, recessionary kind of things, and I think that was mostly 2007, 2008. So, yeah. mm -hmm. not sure what uh, what's going on there. It's very interesting though that you found that and pointed that out. So, uh, looks like the DUI one maybe dipped in 2004. Um, oh, and then the DUI dipped in 2006, you're right, and the medical dipped in 2004. So very interesting. Of It's so hard to, like, figure this out. This is why this is going to be so difficult to meet a Vision Zero goal because, and as you'll see in the fatal crashes, unfortunately, you know, we, have, we listed them, but we just wanted to show that there's a lot of factors that go into all these different crashes, and this is kind of what the data proves out is there's so many things that go on, and... We're, we're trying to really address as many as we possibly can, but there's only so much you can do with the resources available. So we're going to have to put more effort into communication, education, enforcement, engineering. So all those different things that you hear about all the time are going to have to get more resources to make this really follow the trends that we, we want to see. So, Phil, um, because you mentioned engineering, that, that's what I kind of care about is the design. So like when <clears throat> when crashes happen, I don't know if you had a chance to read the sustainable safety packet I gave you, but uh, one of the Dutch principles now is sending engineers out to every crash to try to innovate and come up with a creative solution instead of building the road as we always do, but come up with uh, different ideas. I don't know if that's something we have the capacity to do that even, but an idea. No. <laughs> well, the things you're talking about is exactly why I'm here to, it's kind of my wheelhouse of uh, signals, intersections, and um, roadway signs and striping. So um, one thing, we have a lot of uh, plans coming with Vision Zero, new transportation uh, comprehensive plan, and uh, there are new technologies I'm looking at um, that we're very excited to bring to you all eventually, um, hopefully early this year. Um, but looking at other countries, other states, um, and how they handle traffic is something I frequently do and try to find creative solutions. Uh, one of the biggest issues that comes to roadway users is having a predictable roadway because there's a lot of stuff we could put on the road. Um, but when your seven-year-old grandmother who just goes to the store to get uh, groceries, you know, maybe once or twice a week, she comes up with this intersection and you can't decipher it. A um, good example is the continuous flow intersections you start seeing popping up around. Uh, engineering, by the numbers, they look great, um, but sometimes you have to back it up with, this is how we're improving safety. Um, in kind of more of a residential setting, they're not as great because you get a lot more confused drivers who are going the wrong way, roundabouts. Um, that aren't properly designed is a good example of that. I'm sure everyone's seen mm -hmm. someone take the, a left through a roundabout versus going right, even though there's 20 signs that say go this way. Um, so that's something uh, we all consider when putting things out in the roadway is can anyone go up to this intersection and be able to navigate it without too much pause? Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the big things I'm going to be proud of is data-backed engineering. So any of these projects that we're going to be Implementing, um, providing additional resources for, I'm very big on having before and after studies um, showing that we can decrease um, crashes or severity of crashes. 
um, and then make sure we're getting good reporting. So um, I'm big, also a big problem of working with our police department where it's a collaborative effort, not just pointing fingers at it's PD's problem, you know, talking about uh, underreporting. Um, I do believe most officers um, report truthfully on the reports um, because if they do not truthfully put stuff that's on the report, if they hand out a ticket, that gets thrown out in court and prosecutors don't like that. Um, so a good way is to say, we're missing this information. Can your officers provide additional, are they distracted driving? How were they distracted driving? And then continuously seeing what police officers see in the field of, well, they said they weren't, but they were. Um, so I'm very big proponent of collaboration with all departments in the city and then backing that up with continuous data. So um, to answer your question, yes, we're looking at lots of different technology options and looking for um, budget friendly so we can do more areas at once, um, but also looking at our highest need areas as well, yeah. which I think is our next section as well. So but, and and <clears throat> to to mention roundabouts, you know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm a big fan of them. I, mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan of how we how we build them here, um, just because I, I um, because it, in the crash report there is what one roundabout that's on a common. Uh, Yep. Bountiful or whatever. And oh, just, yeah. yeah, just looking at that, it's just like, well, I think a car can actually just kind of zoom through instead of mm -hmm. forcing a slowdown. Yep. Yeah. And that's part of the engineering of engineering yeah. it correctly yeah. and providing yeah. the right solution in the right area. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot with the roundabouts or any traffic calming measures, it's all about deflection. Um, and a lot of those areas, they'll, um, you see a lot of the neck downs where they just bring in the road and have a bulb out. The problem is, the guy going straight, just go straight, no reason to stop. Um, I've ex uh, tried out uh, diverging diamonds where you kind of go out and back in. Uh, I've seen those work really great. Um, residential perception hasn't been totally great on those because they're a little intrusive to the neighborhood. Um, but as far as speed reduction, uh, it's significant speed reduction in areas. Um, so um, something like that, I think the easiest ones we can do right now are road diets. Um, I've seen about 20% uh, reduction of speeds on level roadways in residential areas. Um, so it's a great way to slow people down and it's cost effective. Um, so that's the kind of solutions we're kind of looking for is uh, right. what benefit we're getting and make sure we're yeah. being equitable across uh, residential, uh, Main Street, all the different sections of the city. So, yeah. And I, I guess one, one more point is because the overall crash is 60% were at intersections, 40% mm -hmm. at signalized, and Again, talking about roundabouts, traditional four-way uh, intersections, at least for my research, is 32 conflict points, mm -hmm. where a roundabout is eight. So I would just like to see you know, us become Carmel, Indiana. But <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find out, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, and yeah. you know, those are always good options. Uh, fortunately, those do take a considerable amount of time and uh, funds yeah. to construct. Yeah, yeah. But um, one thing we are looking at is how to make the intersection experience a little more predictable and also uh, reducing stop and delays in the area. So yeah. it's something we're um, yeah. really looking to this um, next that, that, cycle that, that, of That's our the plan. other advantage is roundabouts mm -hmm. reduce emissions by 30% mm -hmm. as well. Yep, because you're not yeah. stopping and going. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So um, looking ways to improve and so always trying to think if there's another solution besides a cookie cutter solution. All right. So Cool. Kyle, um, I think I heard you say that You've seen a 20% reduction in crashes related to road diets? Uh, speeds. 20% reduction in speed. And do you mm -hmm. attribute that to just the psychological effect of having a narrower travel lane? Um, yes. Um, so generally, especially uh, residential is usually the best example of this um, because you have a predictable um, type of car that goes through there. Um, a lot of it is how comfortable is it for a person to just drive down the roadway. Um, I know probably everyone's been guilty of it. Long day at work, you're coming home, just zoned out, and you realize you're going 45 coming up Main Street when it goes down to 35, and you don't realize it. And that's a lot of what the road diet radar signs do help with, is keeping the honest people honest. And that helps target, as far as enforcement goes, of who are the people that aren't gonna be affected by those measures. Um, so. Uh, I know off the top of my head, I had three different streets this last year that we put road diets on in my last city. 
um, we dropped the 85th percentile in speed from 32 miles per hour down to 26. And that is just by road diet. Um, we reduced the lanes down to 10 feet and provided an eight foot parking lane on each side for, um, res for homes. So uh, something, again, uh, when we look at what we're putting out in the roadways, I like to back up by data because then we can say that it is working. Do we need to do more? Do we need, are we doing too much? And how are we affecting traffic in the surrounding area as well? So not increasing cut through traffic to different areas. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, I wanna go back to um, distracted driving for a moment. Does Longmont PD ever check mobile phone records to try to determine whether a driver was using a mobile phone at the time of a crash? You know, I watch a lot of crime shows on TV <laughs> and they're always contacting the mobile phone providers to get information. <laughs> so I guess I couldn't totally answer for them. I know for, I know like for something like a fatal, they do a pretty in-depth like investigation. Um, as you go down that scale, I'm not just sure how much I, they investigate that. Once you get down to like the property damage only, I. I'm not sure. I don't think they're trying to like lie to us or anything, but um, yeah, that's kind of my answer. And maybe that's something I can reach out to PD and see if. Also, there's situ also like there's situations where um, they don't have a lot of information to go on, especially for like a single vehicle that like runs off the road, hits a utility pole or something like that. Like that person might leave the scene, and they might just be going kind of on like a witness account. So those situations pop up as well. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Do we track in this hit and run? Do we track hit and run? Yes, we can. We do have that information. Yes, it's okay. not on here. Okay, like as in like a gross number of like hit and runs, but yeah, I, I would just be curious because yeah. that seems to me would be where you you're not going to get obviously the information as to because the hit and run driver does something and they leave. We don't know what the cause of the action was, but I'd be curious to find out what the overall gross numbers are in terms of hit and run as it relates to the safety in the city. Yeah, and then, um, I think if you go back, I mean, there's like bicyclists that leave the scene as well sometimes. So it's like sometimes you're not even getting like a full account from them in the police report, but. Okay, so this is like section sevens, the high crash locations. So this is a lot of different tables. Um, it's kind of the same format that's been on previous reports. Um, the table A and B are added. Um, this was a bit of a late addition, but um, there's like a bolded line on each of those. So everything above that is something that was previously a high crash intersection or location, but has dropped off. And then below that are new locations that have come onto the lists. So um, I guess some notable ones to kind of point out here, and they're not in, I guess they're not in any particular order. I was probably going from like class 1A, 1B, 1C. So like the numbers in any of the columns aren't necessarily in any kind of order. Um, but so third in Maine um, went off the list because we saw that go down from 65 total crashes to 54. Um, and you can kind of look, some of these, um, it, it might be kind of, like for something like Airport and Clover Basin actually, and then we changed that to protected left turn only operation. So that could be a reason why that those numbers have dropped. So some of them I have like a pretty clear explanation. Some of them I probably have to research it more to see why or what categories of crashes went down. Um, but, um, and then some of it was also the ADT numbers influence 
how these are ranked. So there's like the average daily traffic, sorry. Explain my acronyms. Um, which I, I've, I kind of question how much that even has like bearing on these because it's kind of an old predictive methodology we've been using for a while. Um, but then there's also the argument to be made that you just go by crashes and that's it. Um, either way, that's where you see some of like the, like third and Martin at the bottom there, it actually went down, but it went up. So I, that's like some ADT like methodology getting moved to like a different class. So I figured I'd be honest about it. That sometimes um, the methodology does work out sort of strangely or not how you'd expect. But um, I think most of, a lot of these you can see like at least in the top rows on table A and B, you can see like a reduction happening. So, is, and it also is weighted, oh, sorry. But it is weighted as well. So if it previously had a lot of like serious injuries and those have like kind of dropped off, then that can also change its ranking, even if it's just one, but that's weighted heavily, then it can move is, it down. Is there any idea why Third Avenue is populated the below the bold line, which are the, the higher crash index numbers? Do you have any maybe thoughts on why that kind of shows up? So are you like third in Lashley and third in Martin? As well as third in Bowen. Yeah, so third in Lashley and third in Martin, I think was a case. So I ended up adjusting some of the ADTs down. Well, because on some of them, I think I was actually overestimating it. So I was trying to be a little bit more accurate. So that's part of it. Like it goes to... So it might have been in the higher class with like highway with Kim Pratt and Maine. So it looked pretty low compared to those, but then in like the more class one B it ranked higher. Right, but there's three Third Avenue instances in these ten, so that's thirty yeah. percent. So is there a trend with Third Avenue that you hadn't noticed prior or and or we're noticing now that's causing there to be a higher rate of conflict? Yeah, I mean, like, 3rd and Lashley and 3rd and Martin are both very, like, similar, close together, that same section. 3rd and Bowen's more, it is on the collector section. So I I would think of those a little differently. But, like, yeah, 3rd and Lashley, 3rd and Martin. Yeah, I mean, it's like we actually had a, there was actually a crash at 3rd and Lashley recently. But I think it was pretty. Well, and also I think you've seen out there that we've done some projects on the east portion of that 3rd Avenue. So uh, you'll see that we did some median treatments as well as some um, um, more of that um, complete streets road diet that, that Kyle was mentioning earlier. So we currently now have, uh, well, we just put out this year those uh, bicycle lanes, buffered bicycle lanes. We've narrowed the lanes of traffic as well. We've lowered the speed limit. So there's been a bunch of different things that have happened in the last, I would say, two or three years that will hopefully change these trends, right? So when, when you see them pop onto the list in 2021, um, we're hoping that what we've done in the last year and the last two years have, will bring those back down below. But the third and Bowen is, is an anomaly of some sort and we need to figure out kind of what's going on there as far as what, what type of crashes and, uh, and why they're going up. For the third and Bowen, my understanding third's gonna be re paved and re-looked at in a different way, so that'll probably help, but then do we get to see a little bit of that design before anything? That's the idea, All that's right. the idea. Cool. cool. Bring it out to the public and make sure there's buy-in for those different designs. All right, cool. And then table B is like the, um, with just with the, the segments instead of the intersections as well. Um, Oops, real quick, Jim's saying that February, he's planning to come out to the um, public, meeting. public meeting for that. Yeah, and actually in the segments, um, that Collier Street, 17th to 23rd, like that's pretty high, like 21 for a collector segment. So that's something that like kind of stood out to me as something to look at. Cause I mean, that's like a, 
parking lane, bike lane, two through lanes each direction kind of segment. So also main and 23rd. It was kind of like already approaching that like 1.0 thresh threshold before, but it's like now jumped into like the high crash segments. But um, the rest of these are a lot of tables with a lot of information going on. Um, I will say like Highway 119 in Main Street, it's been the high crash intersection for years. Um, very high volume, at least as part of it. Um, I have, I did break down at least the top three, because I know I've been asked this before into, in my notes here, into like what types are these? Um, and it's like 119 in Maine, like 159 of those are rear ends. But um, 24 are like front to side, so like right angle broadsides. Um, 21 are actually same direction side swipes. And then 19 are approach turn or like the left turn type crashes. And um, for Highway 66 in Maine, we have 63 rear ends. Um, 32 approach turn, left turn type crashes, which we did change that to protected only left turn operation. Now it's like it all blurs. I don't remember exactly which year that was, but um, that will hopefully bring that down over time. Um, 16 front to side. Um, 10 that just say curb, which usually means like sort of either running over the one of the channelizing islands or running off the side of the road somehow. And then same, again, the nine were the same direction side swipes. And um, 17th in Maine, 75 of those were rear ends. Um, 27 were the approach turn left turn types. And then 24 were the front to side with 18 the same direction side swipes. So with those, it, it's important context because rear ends tend to happen at signals. In fact, when you signalize an intersection, your number of rear ends might actually increase because you're introducing a stop that perhaps wasn't there before. But when we have the left turn and front to side, like the broadsides, there's potentially some changes in left turn phasing and signal operation that can be made to try to alleviate that, so. And I can like send these numbers to you. I know I just like rattled off a lot of like numbers, but if anyone's interested, I have files available, so. Um, yeah, just looking through, um, a lot of these intersections are pretty similar to what they have been before. Um, Mountain, Alpine Street and Mountain View Avenue is still on the Class 1B section. But a lot of those crashes actually happened before it was signalized, because that didn't get signalized until 2020. Um, unless anyone has any like specific questions about any of these, I was not going to go through all those we'd be here. I've already taken up a lot of time. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then section eight was new to what we've done in previous years. This was like all the fatal crashes with a location and at least like some level of detail of description of what happened. Um, it's a question that we get a lot, like, especially in the context of considering vision zero. I think it's good information to have. Um, like I said, I haven't done this in quite this way before. So, and I realize sometimes it's helpful to have like a visual, but um, that would have made this quite long. But um, hopefully I was effective in explaining what was happening without using too many personally identifying details. Um, and I think some of the takeaway of this for me, at least for me, 
was um yeah th there's a lot going on in some of these fatal crashes that happen with varying degrees of like engineering influence you can have over that um and some of them just don't have like even like the actual reports don't have a ton of detail to get a lot of insight into what might have been happening. Um, and I mean, like the locations are pretty, you know, as like talking about this before, there's not necessarily one location where it's, you know, Highway 66 in Maine, there's been, you know, three plus fatals that have all have to do with the eastbound left turn or something very like yeah, concrete, then you can go out and make that, you know, change the timing on the eastbound left turn. A lot of them are at various different places and it's not always so consistent, but it's something I've read a lot into. So I don't know if anyone had any questions about any of these, but. I think also we, as staff, would like to hear your suggestions on what you'd like to see in the report. Um, we've tried to provide as much as we can in this, but if there's any suggestions on how we can uh, improve this report in the future, that would be wonderful too. But otherwise, that's all we have from staff on the crash data report. Uh, yeah, um, thank you mm -hmm. for the report. Um, I'd like to know more about how you guys are using it. Um, is it reprioritizing our dollars or our efforts, or is it um, showing new problem areas that we didn't know we had? How, it's a great job putting together this report. How are we using it, is my question. Well, I think when we do our TIP report, when we come to you with the dollars we're going after for federal, prod, well, for federal grant dollars, You'll see that a lot of these intersections are on, that have something to do with it, maybe ancillarily, <laughs> ancillarily, um, but like 66 in Maine, that's part of a broader project that we're doing on State Highway 66 for safety. Uh, County Line Road, we're doing a project there and you saw some crashes on County Line Road. So when we get this data, we do use it as far as which, which projects are we gonna go after in the future? And where should we go after those dollars? Do we come up with them internally? Do we go out and use this data to justify some of the dollars that we need to get from grants? Yeah, I, th I think the other part was that maybe, I, you know, it could just be used to affirm where we already knew we were and, and um, where we're going with things. So um, if that's the case, that's great. That means we have some, some good direction and in, in everything going on. But um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you. So just to follow up with additional information, um, we, we basically, it's data. So we use it to, to help us generate where we can do improvements. Um, in some cases, it will be larger scale capital improvements. Um, and, and the example I will use on that is, is the, what you don't see in this uh, report is the Pike Road Main Street intersection, which we had identified for a number of years as one of the top 10 intersections. So when, as Pike Road came to be uh, a project that we were going to put on um, multimodal improvements on, we also looked at Main Street and what we could do with the traffic signal in conjunction with the CDOT improvements. Um, unfortunately, some of these projects for the capital take years to develop. Um, one of the other items we, we utilize is every year we budget in our operating budget a certain amount of dollars for uh, safety improvements. So we'll do, we'll look at some of these intersections. We may do small scale signal improvements such as changing some of the timings or adding protected movements so that if we identify that there's a number of, of left turn crashes, uh, we'll go out and we, we did it recently a few years ago on Airport Road where we saw um, some incidents of kids getting either sideswiped or, or, or actually hit early in the mornings because of the, the way the signal was configured for the flashing yellow, we took that out and added in a, a protected left so that 
vehicles who are making that left uh, left going southbound actually had to stop, wait for the signal to go green in conjunction with the the the, the walk movements. So we we will we'll constantly use this data to kind of craft the next few years of small scale safety improvements as well as larger scale capital projects. Again, thank thank you, staff, for that report. A lot, lot of information here, and we can obviously talk about it all, all evening, I'm sure. Um, one question I had about this in terms of this information getting disseminated to the public, what efforts could be taken on the city on behalf of education? And I just thought about things like, you know, the idea of the time of day and letting people know, of course, driving, hey, time of day, did you know that from three to four, we have as high of a rate of accidents as we do from five to six, or the, the month, the fact that October has a higher rate of accidents in December, would education and any sort of effect be something that's gonna help us maybe bring these numbers down? Yeah, I mean, I, there's definitely more we could be doing on like getting this information out there, on our, especially on our website. Um, the actual, actually, um, this report wasn't even really easily available. Um, it is the 20, so the 2016, 2020 report is actually on our website now, but even that is maybe not as like advertised as it could be. But um, yeah, I think that's like definitely a good suggestion to like try to increase some of the findings from this report and get that out to the public. And um, one thing I actually did not mention, both actually a pretty big determination in the high crash intersection list was, um, so before, um, so when we do, when we have our database, we exclusively get that information from Longmont PD, but um, there are areas in the city where Longmont PD does not necessarily do all um, like post accident like reporting. So what I did this time was I actually dug through like the CDOT um, spreadsheets and um, found, that's why Highway 66 and Pace is now on the high crash list, because it really should have been probably for a while, but it was being very undercounted, because Colorado State Patrol usually handles a lot. At 66 is probably like the weakest point where, especially out east, where you can get a lot of Colorado State Patrol reporting that doesn't necessarily come through us directly. And even then, it's um, a little flawed, because you're kind of relying on the state it's like master spreadsheet that doesn't get updated very often. So that was only current through, even through like 2020. So like they don't have the 2021 edition up yet, but I wanted to throw that in, so. Hey, thanks again for all this information. That's, that's a lot of data to, to um, churn through. Um, I'm wondering, do you feel that you have enough data here or the, t the type of data is adequate to um, begin working on um, Vision Zero? I mean, does it give you enough information to make progress in that regard? I think it sends us on a track. I mean, it's, like you said, the data is out there. There's a lot of data, as you can tell. Caroline did an amazing job of putting this all together in a fairly tight time frame, too, because we had some issues with the, um, how the data was developed and, 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 and provided to us. So there's been a lot of screening of this data to make sure it's, it, it, it makes sense for what we're trying to do. But for Vision Zero, this is a good starting point. And I think what we do is we take this, and exactly what was said on the board is uh, assimilate it into something that's more digestible maybe by the public and something that we can use to educate the public. The different, different elements of, um, you know, I, I'm guessing October, November, December are higher crash rates because people are just starting to figure out, oh yeah, I now have to figure out how to drive on snow again or rain or, you know, and it's, it's getting into those factors of people adapting and then you see in January, February, March, people have figured it out by then, but there might be a bunch of different factors to that. It's just a matter of getting that word out and trying to figure out how we get that information out to the public. Well, let, let me just say, um, Caroline, you did a great job. I found it was very readable for as much data as there was and um, um, easy to understand what you were presenting. So, and thank you for walking us through that. It was very helpful.
Yes, uh, I also appreciate the information you've provided. And I spent some time looking at the fatal crash data in the report. And uh, specifically, I compared the information on figure 1.0 with the data on table 6.2 and the crash reports in section 8. And I found what appeared to be discrepancies in the number of fatalities. And I wonder if, um, if I'm not understanding something or if there could be some discrepancies in the report. And uh, for the years 2017, 2018, and 2020, the, the, the numbers of um, what I assumed were fatalities and now I think I understand where crashes with fatalities don't seem to match um, from, from figure to table to a text description of the events. So for example, uh, 2017, mm -hmm. figure 1.0 says that there were eight crashes with fatalities. Is that correct? I think I know the answer to this, but yes. And table 6.2 reports it as six. So I think what I did, so if you look at the back. And let me go on, just one more thing. Okay. And when I went and looked at all the reports in section eight, I mm -hmm. came up with 11 fatalities. And I know that one of those had two dead people. So you would think of that as 10 fatal crashes. But there's still a big difference, you know, six, eight, ten. Wh which is the the correct number of fatal crashes in 2017? And I ask that because my concern is that if the fatality numbers in Table 6.0 are inaccurate, then the crash rate comparisons in Table 6.1 and Table 6.2 are also inaccurate. So the ones, so in section eight, if it's highlighted in red, yeah, that was from Colorado State Patrol. Okay, and you so know that's that they reported a fatality. That, except there's there's one yeah. place where so that in a, go ahead. So in so that is like so it's six in the table. This is where. Are, are you saying that if Longmont PD didn't investigate and file the report, it doesn't count as a fatal crash? I, it might not have been. It might have been a mistake that it wasn't added in to one of the tables. But it's certainly because it's not. Because it, it's not in our data. Quite frankly, it's not in our database. So you have to remember that, like extra on top, but I, it's, I was trying to be as honest as possible, include everything I could find, so. Any other response? I, I, I think the, the data you're seeing from, I wanna, I wanna try to answer for Caroline, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, the, the, the chart that was section one, uh, figure 1.0, mm -hmm. I think what, we, what we've done is that was the, what we had recorded in past years so in the, the spreadsheet at the back, that was data we recently added this year. Okay, so we probably didn't update the old data from the, the chart. We probably just carried the chart over from previous years. So we would have to update that uh, when we added in this year, when we added in those, those accidents in red. We had never done that before previously. Um, did that explain, is that? Yeah, that's what we probably. Did, the, 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 this was the first year we included data from outside of the Longmont PD. Mm -hmm. That's what the discrepancy is. So we'd have to update the, go back and update the charts for the last five years. All right, well, would you be willing to consider the report that we have tonight as a draft and you have staff take another look at it and uh, run it through your certainly we can insurance we, protocols? Certainly we can update that data. Okay, great. Uh, another question. I see that much of the information in section seven, as you've explained, Ms. Michael, is categorized by 
average daily traffic volumes. Would it be possible to evaluate crash data, and I guess this would mostly apply to stretches of road in between intersections, by average traffic speed rather than average uh, daily traffic volumes. It seems that that might be useful information as Longmont proceeds with uh, Vision Zero. Do you have the data? About so for what average speeds are and so for the average sort of speed thing. just on say like Main Street, Third to Fourth Avenue. Yeah, we do have some counts like that. Yes, that do give us an average speed. Mm -hmm. um, or were you asking about the average like speeds like on the report, or just like the okay? What I'm trying to get at is, um, can we use the data to? come up with some relationships between traffic speed and the types of crashes that involve bodily injury and death and maybe use that as as input to the the vision zero process because I'm not sure that uh, average daily traffic volumes really helps you much with vision, vision zero as you said Phil I mean, if the traffic volumes result in congestion, then you'd have fewer crashes just because the roadway is congested and no one can travel at a high speed. So I'm trying to find out the relationship between average vehicle speed and crashes. So for this report, the answer would be we really don't have enough of that data. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think as, as as we get into a Vision Zero program, there will be a component of that where you collect a lot more data. Um, and I would, the, the PD uh, is currently looking at, um, they, they just picked up some equipment uh, within the last few weeks that we funded through the street fund for them to, to start collecting um, speed data throughout the city. They got several portable machines where they're gonna put them up so they can identify where people are speeding. Um, they're going to share that data with us, and then we can start building a database of where where people are speeding, and, and start collecting those speeds at various times of day. Uh, but as part of Vision Zero, you will see more of that data collection, and we can certainly mm -hmm. um, add that into future reports as we collect it. But um, that would be a factor. Uh, speed is usually something they always look at in police reports, although we don't uh, record it here. Uh, because it's usually, a, as it, for the ADT, it is an estimated number, but certainly I think speed is, is will be a, a, a big factor in a lot of accidents, and it will be a component of Vision Zero in, in that lowering speeds is one of their, their primary uh, directives in the Vision Zero kind of overall mm -hmm. program. So uh, as we move into that, there will be a component of collecting that data, yes. Thanks, Jim. A as I travel around Longmont, sometimes I see these what look like little white trailers at the side of the road with a digital display. And the display that I see as a motorist is, you know, what my speed is and whether I should slow down or not. But are those pieces of equipment also recording the speeds of all the vehicles that pass by? That equipment is not. It's not. Those so are speed it, trailers. It would only just, be this new equipment. It's that the newer would, equipment that, uh, that we, we've, they're actually portable. They're just like our, our, uh, if you look up on Kimbark, those radar signs we have that show the speed limit, they're very similar to that. They're portable. Mm -hmm. And they're a newer model that records the speed of data. It'll, it'll do traffic counts as well. Uh, then they're uploaded to the cloud, and then um, we have, we'll have that data uh, every time they, uh, they install one or put one out and leave them out there. Uh, they, they're looking at when they, when the, what PD has found is they get reports of, of, from various residents of people speeding on this road. Um, but for them to make the best use of their personnel, uh, they want to know when those people are speeding so that they can use their, their, their personnel more effectively. If they know that it's done at certain times of day, uh, they'll be able to do that. In the meantime, we'll, we'll record that speed and then the, the counts and data so we'll have more accurate information. So if it's successful, we'll buy a few more next year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that so we'll seems see to me like it would be very useful. Yeah, they just picked them up this year. So we, we had some funds at the end of the budget year, so we helped them buy them. So we'll see what it looks like. And then uh, there's a number of, of tools out there. I think 
we're picking up we're picking up some new new counter systems as opposed to the tubes you put down in the road we're going with a, um, a more of a uh, using radar um, and when we do traffic counts uh, traditionally you had like these rubber tubes that go across the road that count cars uh, there's radar systems out there we're going to start using that are less expensive and, and safer for our our traffic tech to put out uh, we've got um, for doing pedestrian counts, we've got actually portable video cameras we put on a pole, and then they record data, and then we fast forward it while we count pedestrians at intersections. So there's a lot of uh, technology out there, and and as we we move into kind of Vision Zero and, and better data collection, we'll you'll see uh, we'll probably have to increase our our uh, our traffic staff, uh, and those are proposals that'll be defined as we we get into the action plan uh, through the course of next year. Great, thanks. Uh, my next question is really for any and all of you to uh, respond to, and I will be asking you to speculate. So in your professional opinion, what effect on fatal and serious injury crashes would an across-the-board five-mile-per-hour speed limit reduction in Longmont have? And how about a 10-mile-per-hour reduction? Well, I would, well... <laughs> It's interesting. If you just, so just changing a speed limit with doing no other roadway, like no other roadway changes, like just changing the sign, I don't know how effective that would be because people tend to sort of drive what they feel is right for a particular, you know, roadway section. So I don't know, that would maybe just road be so like an artificial, like, you post it lower, but you don't change anything else. So are people going to like actually behave any differently? Probably maybe not long term without like some enforcement. Um, also with, I guess with, um, so in all these crash reports too, they have usually a driver's estimated speed listed on them. But um, if you try to go by, it gets complicated. I've tried to look at like the speed differential between them or like the highest speed because sometimes you're really looking at the speed of the vehicle that's not at fault because if someone's turning left and is turning left like at fault, then I mean, they're not turning left at like 80 miles an hour. So you're really looking at the second vehicle that's maybe going the speed limit that's 45. So... Okay. Just some insight into that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ben Ortiz, Transportation Planner. Um, I think the, the short answer is probably not much. Um, I had a conversation with um, one of City of Boulder's transportation planners, um, and we had the opportunity to discuss their Vision Zero program where they lowered the speed limit 20 miles per hour in their, on their local streets. And what he indicated to me was that they, they actually didn't really see any reduction in speeds and that while the, the lowered speed limit is enforceable, the um, police department isn't actually enforcing the lower speed limit. Um, and so what he's indicated to me is that it really hasn't resulted in a behavior change. Um, what it has done is it has... Um, stimulated a conversation on speeding and um, the need to, to bring down speeds by other means other than lowering the speed limit. But, but I, I had Caroline's job um, when I was here many years ago, my first job here, and um, the traffic engineer at that time was very reluctant to lower speed limits um, just to try to bring down speeds because he was fairly convinced that it wouldn't work, and and the evidence is 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 fairly compelling that that's that's the case. Um, yeah, like like Ben said, um, signs are just signs, and the big you're you're not wrong. Lowering the speed means people are going over the speed limit. You were correct in that manner. The problem is is they're still doing the thing they're not supposed to be doing. And it's the same thing. I have a toddler at home, and he's staring at something like a chair that he wants to climb up of. And I'm like, no. Looks at me and says, eh, I'm going to try it. So a lot of it, it's 
maybe kind of a demeaning uh, analogy, but drivers like that are like toddlers. You got to make them think it was their idea to go that speed limit, to do that certain speed, because if everyone followed every law we had, not, wasn't distracted, we'd hardly have any crashes. The reason why crashes do happen is people are going too fast, they're too aggressive, and they sometimes just don't care. So a lot of it is getting people to do what they want without them realizing that they're doing it. So lowering the speed limit really won't make the roadway safer. It's more a uh, combination of putting out non based measures, more psychological measures like road diets, um, signs, maybe more enforcement, or even just figuring out who and why they're speeding. Because a lot of things you'll see, it's the same person. So is it a widespread issue, or is it one person driving down the road that everyone sees who thinks it's just a repeating issue? Um, so in my opinion, no, changing the speed limit doesn't really change the speed limit. It's changing driver behavior. It's going to change the speed limit. So. Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> so, so going back to your, your question, to, to lower the speed limit 20 miles per hour universally throughout the city, um, I don't think, as been indicated in, in our residential streets, I don't, that's not where you're seeing the major accidents and fatalities. It's on our arterials and collectors. So I would think lowering the speed limit with, as Kyle indicated, with some other improvements will work to change behavior and could make a difference. Uh, there are some areas, an example of night, that's 45 miles per hour. I think if you lowered the speed limit 5 to 10 miles per hour in that roadway, might improve it. So I think it's, it's something that, that, as part of Vision Zero, we would have to look at on, on our, our major arterials. Um, the example, uh, one of the examples of, of lower speed limits doesn't always help with fatalities is one of the fatalities was on Main Street where it was in a 25 mile per hour speed limit. So it isn't always speed that's the problem. Um, it's, the, it's the behavior of a driver who was, it was, it was a DUI. So um, I, th I think, you know, universally lowering the speed limit um, will not be effective um, overall throughout the city, but I think in case-by-case -case basis, we have to look at that, and that's where we'll see success. Did you say that a drunk driver traveling 25 miles per hour? No, he's in a 25-mile-per-hour zone. So okay. whether it doesn't matter what the speed limit, what you set the speed limit at. Okay. Okay. That's just an example of That's just one example. Limit. Got it. All right. Thank you to all of you. That's it for my comments and questions on the crash report. Well, I got one more. <laughs> well, I, I, I think to reiterate is, you know, I agree. Vision Zero is all about speed control and separation. So once speeds go higher, then you separate your pedestrians and your bikes um, off the, the main road. And when I'm looking at the map of the, what, uh, bikes and peds, um, do we have any data of what was peds versus bikes in terms of crashes? Uh, I'm looking at the what, principal arterial roads, bikes and peds. Yeah, so like, are you asking whether you can break that down into yeah. just bikes? Yeah, you can. Okay. And that's, we have, I have it, it's just not presented that way. I can, I did like write this down because I realized it wasn't on there. Um, but for 2021, I saw like 36 separate bicycle crashes and then 31 separate pedestrian crashes. And then do we keep data of like how those happen potentially? Mm -hmm. So like was yes. the pet trying to cross the road and yes, maybe, we do. yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and actually a lot of what I've seen, especially with bikes, is they don't, bikes act like pedestrians because they're like on the sidewalk hmm. and some of these yeah. are like conflicts oh. at, yeah, because bikes obviously go faster than a pedestrian, so even if someone might think they're clear, like, pulling out of the driveway, they maybe don't see the bike that's coming a lot faster, like, downhill. So it's, 
Yeah, like bikes mostly, like a lot of them are like crossing and like the pedestrian crosswalks. I would okay. say most of these are due more so to that than like bikes acting like cars and like using a bike continuous like bike lane on the roadway. Okay. It's definitely like a pattern I'm seeing, but. And then uh, is there a trend of bikes if a crash is on the roadway? Um, because at, at least according to CDC, it's 64% of death is on on the road and 27 is at an intersection for a, a bicyclist. So, uh, and, and that's where I want to tie into that vision zero of, yeah. of separation um, would be key. Now, we don't have many deaths, luckily, but... Um, but yeah, just, just an idea. No, yeah, we do, we have that can be broken down. Okay. Yeah, I have more like detail than necessarily what's on there. But um, sometimes it's like trying to f present it in a way that makes yeah. sense. But yeah. um, yeah, there's a, so I there's a lot of I have it broken down by like signalized intersections, unsignalized, and then like the mid blocks. Okay. So. That's something I can develop or okay. present if yeah. anyone's interested in it. But I'm, I'm curious. Okay. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. I think we can move on. <clears throat> However, I think I want to reiterate what Board Member McInerney asked for, that we treat this as a draft. And some of the changes that are made, we just get a chance to take a look at that. And maybe the, the ped bike separation data would be good to also have as part of the, the I won't call it correction, the addition or the change. Yes, thank the, we want to thank the board very much for all your input because this does help us kind of craft the draft, as it were. So uh, we'll work on that. Thank you. The next item we had for you, if you're ready and willing and able to go on, is the uh, action item of the Transportation Advisory Board annual report. We've also attached to that the proposed work program for 2023. That's just for your information at this point. We'll actually want you to take a look at that and we'll talk about that in your January meeting um, that, and try to finalize that draft proposed or that proposed work plan then. But at this point in time, we do need you to review the different items that we've done in 2022. We did include the crash report data knowing that that was coming. So we did want to put that on there. This is something we do every, typically every December or January, but we thought we'd have some time today to do this uh, quickly, and it's pretty straightforward. It is the idea that in 2022, we held those nine regular meetings, including the one today. Uh, the first four meetings of the year were conducted in a virtual format. That was because of COVID, basically, we know that. Um, and five meetings, luckily, we were able to start meeting in person. That was wonderful when we could finally get together, and here we are today. So. Um, You'll see the activities listed here. We, we did a resilient St. Frame project update, the sugar factory and steam update, transportation issues in the state legislature. So we brought those to you, we'll bring those to you again. A lot of this will, will come back again next year, but that's one for sure that will come back. That's just an annual one. The update on transportation improvement pro project proposals this year was quite full of that with four different calls for projects. So. Hopefully next year you won't see much more of that, but we will keep you updated on what's going on with our projects through the CIP. We updated the TAB bylaws with language on virtual meetings and notifications. That won't come before you again, so that's pretty much done there. Um, subcommittee to interview new TAB applicants. That's gonna be an annual thing that happens every, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably say May, as we'll have to do that every May. Um, Boulder County report. And update on projects associated with the 119 BRT project. That's going to be something that's probably going to go on for the next two years, at least next year. So you'll get more information on, about that. Boulder County update on mobility and access for all ages. That's a plan that was uh, adopted this year, so that should be done. Boulder County update on 287 BRT. That's something that's going to be ongoing as well, so you'll hear more about that coming up. We always do the capital improvement program, so you'll see that next year. We always like to that's a good one that you guys, uh, there's lots of interaction to talk about how our projects are doing. And then hopefully you'll be able to come back and reference this crash report when we talk about that, how the projects are interrelated to the things we're trying to do for safety. Uh, review and comment on public works, natural resources, operational budget. I think next year it'll be just public works, correct? Yes. <laughs> We've natural resources in a different group starting uh, in a 
couple weeks on January 1st. Work plan and annual report, that's what we're doing today and next month. Um, annual board elections of new chair and vice chair, we were unfortunately had to do that today because we've lost uh, a member who, and, and we appreciate uh, board member Chris uh, stepping up to fill that, fill that role, so thank you very much. RTD update, that's another fun one that we do every year. Uh, we'll invite them back usually March and April time period for that one. The proposed CIP is really where you guys get to say a lot of kind of what, you know, you look at our projects and see what's, what's coming from our public works group and how you can have some input into what projects move forward. Uh, 287 bus rapid transit, that's kind of a carryover from what we just talked about. So uh, need to remove that one as we just had two different presentations last year on that or this year on that. And so one was more of the first round and this is this was more of the phase two piece that we talked about. So that just lets you know that you guys did a lot of work with that this year. And then of course the Vision Zero presentation, that was fairly recent. The Flex Bus update, that was last month as well. And then tonight's uh, high crash location summary. So uh, in draft form, we'll, we'll work on that to get more information on that as well. But you probably won't see that again, but we'll, we'll uh, update it and put it out there and make sure you guys have links to it on the on the web when it uh, comes available. So with that, we're rec requesting that the board uh, review, discuss, and approve the 2022 annual report so we can send it up to your city council and make sure they know all the work you've done this year. Thank you very much. Do we want to have any comments on this or should we move to um, a vote on moving this forward? Do we need to do that? Just because that this is what, meeting four for me? Uh, question on, uh, because obviously we have a council member here uh, most often. Um, how do how does anything that we say also goes to planning and zoning? Just curiosity. Um. Yeah, in the um, in the bylaws, this board is really meant to report directly to city council. You can certainly make that recommendation. We can we can take it up, but it's uh, something not typically done. All right. Well, Unless the planning and zoning commission asks for TAB to look at something specific that right. they can't answer. Right. It just it says recommendations to city council as well as to the planning and zoning commission. So I was just curious. Yeah, I haven't seen that too often. What we sometimes have done in the past, and this doesn't happen as much anymore, is we used to have annexations come through to TAB all the time. Um, but it just got to the point of um, the TAB considered it more of minutia and, you know, access points onto roads. And uh, it was very general. And so uh, we either... It was either too little or we had too much that we brought to this board that couldn't be resolved at the board level. So it would, there was okay. a few times where we had annexations where, uh, like a Walmart, where we had all the information, all the parking and everything, and uh, we spent two hours easily right. on that. So right. <laughs> that's the kind of issues that we got into with the um, annexations. And there really haven't been any annexations that were very transportation specific that we've seen yet. So those were the ones we'd bring to you. Okay. Typically, and if those come back through, we will certainly bring them to you as the transportation issues come up. And then you would make the recommendation to PZ first on those and then up to council. Okay. Thank you. If there are no further comments, I move that we approve the 2022 Transportation Advisory Board Annual Report. I second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much for your time on that. We appreciate it. We'll move that on to council. Okay, um, I'll start on this side with um, Board comments on tonight. Anything else that we want to be brought up? We got one more action item. My mistake. 
Next action item is the 2023 proposed tab work plan and schedule. We just attached that as part of the last agenda item. Okay. So what we'd like, like to do is, that's our draft right. work plan for 2023. In January, we'd love to come, well, we will come back to you yeah. regardless, and we'll talk about um, any changes that you might have to that, that you might wanna see on that work plan. But this is just to get it in front of you a month prior, so it gives you plenty of time to hopefully get over, get through those different items and make sure we're covering everything that you wanna talk about in 2023. Okay, then I'll then start again with the comments from the board, starting at the end. Well, I don't know, it was a very interesting conversation tonight. <laughs> so, um, again, thank you for the very in-depth, a lot of data presentation. Um, I, I do think the crash report will, you know, eventually with Vision Zero, we'll get even more data and then hopefully we can really focus on the, the physics of roads. And, and like we said, signs don't really help. So, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing that discussion. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to reiterate, thank you um, for the crash report. A lot of work went into it, and that, that is clear. Um, uh, yeah, just thank you. If this is going to be a, um, a draft report, then um, there are some editing or proofing issues with it that I'm happy to discuss after the meeting if you want. Um, but um, that's it. Thank you very much. I also appreciate the opportunity to have had uh, a discussion about the crash report, and I look forward to um, coordinating crash information with Vision Zero planning in the future. Um, regarding the 2023 work plan and schedule, I'll give you a hint of what I'll be saying in January. Uh, the only uh, the only place I see Vision Zero on that sheet is under Dr. Cog. So I'll be looking for some City of Longmont Vision Zero action items on our uh, schedule for next year. That's it for me. I wanna say to our two newest board members how much I appreciate the input you've had. Um, really good questions. Um, board member uh, Wickland and Hinterberg. Um, and um, to board member Lehner and McInerney, thanks for um, beginning a rousing discussion with the staff about this, this crash report. I greatly appreciate the effort that's put into um, the safety in our town and all the, the great work that you do for the city of Longmont. And um, thank you all. I would uh, I agree with um, board member McInerney. I think we need to maybe discuss uh, before January 9th as a board, even via email, how we can better assist with Vision Zero. So just an idea. All right, thanks again. And again, um, <clears throat> excuse me to reiterate the um, rest of the comments. Thank you. I know this was a comprehensive report a lot of effort was put into this, so we really do appreciate that. Um, and in regards to that, my, I guess my only comment is, and somebody much smarter than me said this, and you might know this gentleman, Larry Haas, CDOT, always used to joke that, you know, traffic engineering is a rational study of irrational behavior. And so in many cases, lowering a speed limit isn't necessarily going to regulate irrational behavior. So I know the work that you do is, is very important. And I agree with um, the comments regarding Vision Zero. I think that's something that we're, we're invested in as a board that we definitely want to be involved with uh, for 2023. And I'll stop here and, and let Council Member Yarborough uh, offer any comments that she has. Thank you. Um, just want to say, ditto, you know, what everyone else said. It's so much work, so much great work. Thank you for all this information is needed. Um, 
And um, I just love representing the city of Longmont when I go to these conferences. I've only been to two. But it's amazing how much work you all have already done for our city and even the board and to, to say how progressive we are um, and uh, um, to see other cities that's even larger than us really don't have a plan or put anything in place. Um, so I'm definitely honored and grateful to be representing the city of Longmont and you all. So, and thank you for the city, uh, the staff for all the things that you do and all the hard work and the data you put together for us. And I thank the board for um, making sure that the details are transparent. So, thank you. Great. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn our meeting? Sure, I will will move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you.